Alcohol has been a challenge for Clay County residents, as it is for everybody. Brought in a lot of money in the 1890s and the early 20th century, but uh, caused huge problems as well. Production funding for Wet versus Dry is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, and by the members of Prairie Public. The wets are those who are in favor of alcohol, the dries are, are those who are opposed to alcohol and are seeking to ban it. There's really three time periods. The first is settlement, where we're a wild west tent town at beginning in 1871, and each community choosing whether or not alcohol will be a part of that community. The next period is uh, the 25 years between 1890 and 1915, when North Dakota was dry, so Clay County, just over the border in Minnesota, was soaking wet, especially Moorhead becomes a booze boom town. The last period is from 1915 to 1937 when alcohol was prohibited, prohibition in, in Clay County. Settlement here in Clay County started with the Northern Pacific Railroad coming here in 1871. Every year, wherever the construction stopped for the year, a tent town full of laborers popped up, and around the laborers came gunmen, came prostitutes, came gamblers, and came a lot of good people too. But uh, mixed among them were the desperados, the people who want to live one step in front of the law. You know, the trains are now coming to Fargo, but in, in the preparation of getting the bridge built, getting the railroad across, uh, think Helen Wills, the, the television show, that's somewhat of the picture of what it was like. So when the building begins, you have different groups of people. You have the engineers, you have the engineers' families in some cases. They're building the headquarters hotel, uh, which is Fargo and the Prairie. And then Fargo and the Timber is closer down to the river. The alcohol, drinking, gambling, you know, places, and they're intense at this point. So it's a development that goes along with the evolution of a town. The Wild West happened in Minnesota, too. This was the definition of lawless until the gunfight between Shang Stanton and Slim Jim Shumway. April 25th, 1872, the first spring that Moorhead exists, a gambler named Shang Stanton got into an argument with a notorious killer named uh, Slim Jim Shumway. Shang was warned by a friend that Slim Jim was gunning for him. And so Shang's in a saloon and Slim Jim kind of taps him on the shoulder and says, hey Shang. And then Shang doesn't wait to get shot. He turns around and shoots him in the gut. Shang runs out into the street. Slim Jim uh, crawls out after him, shooting all over the place. At the end of it all, two people are lying, dying. Two people need to be arrested. A merchant named Jim Blanchard agrees to uh, be the guy that takes Shang into custody. So he becomes the first sheriff of Clay County. Then they need somebody to try the guy. One of the Railroad laborers happened to be a down-on-his-luck lawyer named Solomon Comstock. Solomon Comstock would later become Moorhead's most influential founding father. He becomes the first Clay County attorney. It was ruled that Shang acted in self-defense. What was left behind was a better place. Farmers came and busted sod. Villages sprouted up, and every time there was a new village, the people decided whether or not alcohol would be a part of it get forward to 1889, and you have North Dakota, South Dakota becoming states. When they became a state, there was a referendum with that, and by a very small margin, North Dakota was dry. It did not change the dynamics, particularly in Fargo, because it's a border city. 
Moorhead, uh, like many quarter communities, became a booze boom town and uh, became a place for thirsty North Dakotans to come to, to drink. By 1900, there were 45 bars operating in Moorhead. Population was about 3,700 at that time. So that's like one saloon for every 80 people in town. Clearly, it wasn't Clay County residents that were supporting these saloons. It was people coming from dry North Dakota. The locations of the saloon buildings in Moorhead during that time period uh, reflect that. Early in the period in 1890, most of the saloons were strung out along what's now Center Avenue in Moorhead and downtown. But by the end of the period, by 1914, 1915, uh, it was clear that the customers are coming from North Dakota. So by 1914, 75% of the saloons were within two blocks of the two bridges between Fargo and Moorhead. So they wanted to be just as close to Fargo as they could. When the saloons in Fargo shut down, across the bridge, the saloons in Moorhead began to come up with really interesting ways to transport people to and from the saloons. And jag wagons came out of this period. A jag wagon is a wagon sponsored by the saloon in Moorhead. So come over here and drink, go over to Fargo to go to the brothels. There's evidence in police records that brothels sold alcohol because my main research topic is a woman named Melvina Massey, who's an African-American madam who came to Fargo around 1886. When she came here, she was clearly working to build her own brothel. We see her in the record in the area where there were several women's boarding houses. The other thing we see in police records is that she was arrested for selling alcohol several times in the 1890s. In 1900, she was prosecuted and convicted of selling alcohol in her brothel and was sent to the state penitentiary in Bismarck. And she was there for nine months. She was the only woman in the penitentiary. The law and Melvina Massey, the law is always about selling alcohol illegally. Now, the city of Fargo, it was illegal to have a brothel, but there was this unofficial tax. Once a month, all the brothel owners went down to City Hall, paid $56.50 for month after month after month. They tried to get rid of it, but it was such a big piece of the city budget that they said, oh, no, we can't get rid of this because if we do, there goes our revenue. One thing I think is interesting about that early founding period is everybody came from somewhere else. Seventy percent of the people that were living here, I think, in 1900 were Scandinavian immigrants or the children of Scandinavian immigrants. And Scandinavia has both a tremendous tradition of hard drinking, but in reaction to that, they have a very strong temperance tradition as well. Um, we also had Lutherans and Catholics coming here uh, from Germany as well, and they have their own traditions with alcohol. And this is all mixed up in a blender uh, in, for the people who are living in Clay County and establishing the communities. Barnesville at this time was uh, Clay County's second largest city. They resoundingly decided that they'd be wet because a lot of German Catholics settling in that area. It, with German Catholic culture comes a lot of tradition of responsible drinking of beer, wine. Barnesville was actually the last place that went dry in Clay County. Many of the saloon uh, owners were also distributors uh, wholesale distributors and, and had what I guess today we would call an off-sale business and they were actually uh, it was uh, illegal to sell liquor in North Dakota but uh, for many years uh, it was possible to either uh, mail or phone in orders to from North Dakota to uh, liquor dealers here in Moorhead and have that stuff shipped out to central North Dakota, western North Dakota, eastern North Dakota uh, by rail have it sent by express and be there the next day. And we have a, a lot of um, records from one particular saloon dealer. And uh, it's, it's pretty clear that uh, uh, these guys out in North Dakota, a lot of them were not buying it for their own consumption. Uh, the vast amounts that they were ordering 
and uh, they'd place a large order of liquor uh, to be sent out to Sanborn, North Dakota, or Eccleson, or someplace like that. And they'd say, have this monitor sent to this guy, and this much sent to this guy, and this much sent to this guy. It's pretty clear that North Dakota, though, technically was dry. Uh, it was, uh, in many places, particularly in the western part of the state, it was soaking wet. It's pretty obvious they were running blind pigs out there. Allegedly, the, the term blind pig comes from uh, New England in the early uh, 19th century. Uh, Maine, other states up in New England were dry. Uh, and there was, apparently there was an enterprising saloon owner that got around the law. You couldn't sell liquor, but uh, what he would do is he, he'd set up his shop and uh, he'd say for, for a nickel or whatever, you can come in and go into the back room and I've got a blind pig in there you can look at and oh by the way you get a free drink with that. The term blind pig was used pretty regularly. Blind tiger was another term that was used in the 1920s and a lot of the country it was called speakeasies. Around here they, they call them blind pigs. When liquor is so abundant in a town, um, uh, a temperance movement is bound to pop up too, people who are opposed to it. There was one particular group they had a saloon league, which is uh, one of the most powerful special interest groups to ever come about in this country. Their main focus was getting the saloons outlawed, uh, and they would work with anybody uh, who would help uh, forward their cause. Here in Minnesota, they worked very effectively in the, in the early teens to get dry politicians elected to the Minnesota state legislature. In 1914, they had a working majority down in the state, and they were able to pass what was called a county option bill. Uh, before the Minnesota had a local option law, that meant that voters of a local community, a township or a village or a city could vote yes or no whether to allow liquor in their township, village or city. By 1914, every Every town in Clay County is dry except for Moorhead and Barnesville. Barnesville may be for more cultural reasons, being a, a center of German Catholic uh, settlement. Uh, Moorhead for business reasons. You know, maybe one in ten people in Moorhead worked in a saloon or lived with somebody who worked in a saloon. There's a quote behind me here attributed to Solomon Comstock, our first county attorney. There were always many Moorhead citizens who were against liquor traffic, but on the other hand, if they took the 47 saloons out of Moorhead, what was left? Why liquor was the principal business of Moorhead. Moorhead's greatest problem was whether to be pure or prosperous. The Drys had to come up with a new solution because local option wasn't enough anymore. Through the influence of the Anti-Saloon League, a county option bill was passed. That meant the voters of the entire county could vote. Voters in the rural parts of Clay County, which are much more dry, or eastern for Clay County, which is heavily Scandinavian, very dry, quickly drafted a petition. They called themselves the No License League of Clay County. They got twice the number of votes that they needed to get a countywide election on the ballot. May 17, 1915, sitting by Norwegian Constitution Day, they passed a county bill. And the drives won, and they make Clay County dry. Thirtieth of June, uh, 1915, exactly 25 years to the day after the saloons in North Dakota closed, the saloons in Moorhead closed. The Moorhead saloons closed with great fanfare and fireworks and a lot of sad drunks. Barnesville liquor licenses had a few more months. They were able to stay open until November, so there was a brief period where Barnesville was a booze boom town too. The brewers and the distillers fought uh, prohibition bitterly. They brought in national speakers. The Anti-Saloon League also brought in speakers and they had dueling speakers here in, in Clay County throughout the uh, spring of 1915. But uh, the election went against the, the brewers and uh, by a large majority, the, really the rural dry areas of the county uh, overwhelmed the, the wet boat in Moorhead and Barnesville and a few other places. After a county option, you know, the Anti-Saloon League, they went bigger. Five years after Clay County goes dry, um, the National Anti-Saloon League is able to lobby Congress and, and uh, they passed the 18th Amendment, which banned intoxicating liquors. Just because you make alcohol illegal doesn't mean people are gonna stop drinking, it turns out.
These saloon men, in large part, became owners of soda shops or cigar stores or candy stores. Liquor was still on the menu if you knew how to ask for it. One of the big stories about Prohibition where we live, we are the first middlemen on the route to Canada. Our rum runners were getting the good stuff from Canada, where alcohol was still legal to make and legal to import. The Canadian liquor industry was hardly even pretending their influx of wealth was coming from selling to rum runners in America. There were a lot of rum runners that lived here. The most notorious was the Schumacher family. Charlie Schumacher, his wife Anna Schumacher, several of their children. They would meet airplanes out in the remote Minnesota and North Dakota prairies or in the woods, and they would find a farmer and pay them some money to be able to use their barn as a liquor warehouse. A lot of these places would have a garage and then maybe a tunnel that would lead from the garage to the house so that you could move the liquor shipments from the car into the basement without anybody noticing. They would sell it to other middlemen that will take it to St. Paul or other rum runners that would maybe take it to Kansas City or, or wherever. We had a lot of local moonshiners. Minnesota was famous for its Minnesota 13 brand of moonshine made from a kind of corn named Minnesota 13. And we have documented cases of Minnesota 13 being made in Georgetown and Barnesville out in the countryside where the smells and the, and the smoke of the stills wouldn't be as noticed. The enforcement of prohibition was really differed from city to city, town to town, cop to cop. In 1927, Moorhead citizens elected a new mayor, Dr. Bottleson, and he enlisted the Moorhead City Police in the fight against alcohol. The arrests skyrocketed from seven alcohol-related arrests in, in the Moorhead Jail in 1926 to 116 in 1927, even more in 1928. That just goes to show that uh, the police knew exactly where to go. Bottleson was voted out of office, and the year that he was voted out of office, uh, we went down to 30 liquor-related arrests. In the middle 1890s, the, the Minneapolis branch of the Salvation Army sent many Lindemann up here to uh, establish headquarters here in Moorhead. She was an officer in the Salvation Army. And uh, uh, the National Salvation Army heard that the problems that Moorhead was having with alcohol. A lot of people today, you know, think of the Red Kettle campaign and raising money and helping out people during times of disaster. But they're primarily a religious organization. Their focus is not only to uh, save souls, but uh, also to, uh, to save bodies as well and uh, attend to the needs of the, uh, of the less fortunate. And uh, they're very active in trying to keep, get people to take the pledge, to stop drinking. And uh, Minnie Lindemann was sent up when she was only 16 years old uh, to Moorhead to run the local Salvation Army. And she set up her headquarters in downtown Moorhead, right down in the Main Avenue Saloon District. At one point, she was doing an outdoor sermon, as they, they did several times a week. And there was a young man who was in town to rob a bank. He had come to town to rob specifically the uh, First National Bank, uh, but uh, he had gone to a saloon to brace himself up to, to get a few drinks in him. Uh, he was fairly well bombed. He came by and he stumbled on, on Minnie's sermon, and he was so impressed by that that afterwards he turned over his gun and uh, turned his life around. She got him a job working on a local farm. When harvest was over, uh, she got him a job in town, and uh, he became a productive member of society. One of the features of the Salvation Army was uh, uh, proselytizing out on the streets and making a big racket, bringing attention to themselves using music and, and, uh, and song. So they would march up and down the streets of Moorhead beating a big bass drum and uh, had a band going. And they did this at all hours of the day and night. And uh, people got a little offended by that. They got a little tired of all this racket. So uh, the city of Moorhead tried to pass an ordinance saying that nobody could use the streets for demonstrations unless they had permission from the city council. Well, Minnie wasn't about to put up with that. 
So she engaged in several acts of civil disobedience, got herself arrested, and some of her associates wound up spending some time in jail. Actually, at the trial, they were sitting in the courtroom waiting for the prosecuting attorney to arrive, his train is going from Minneapolis. And while they're waiting there, she stood up and went around, sold a whole bunch of tickets to a fundraiser that they had going on that night. Uh, but uh, the, the attorney got there, and the judge looked, took one look at the case and said, oh, no, this is full, clear breach of the First Amendment. You, you can't do this. And so she won the case. But they did say that we'll just beat the bass drum at certain times a day in certain parts of town. So they reached an agreement. But uh, extraordinary young woman, only 16 years old. In the 1890s, several groups started working together. Uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union started working with suffrage groups. And so they're bringing the idea of voting and temperance together. And you see that play out by the time the 19th Amendment is actually passed. The WCTU, it's not religious people who are just trying to control things. There was a legitimate reason for them to be against alcohol because they saw the effects of what alcohol did to families. And so their goal, honestly, was to push for prohibition believing that it would protect families. And this is also part of the, the progressive movement. The progressive movement, which basically starts around 1890, ends when Woodrow Wilson goes out of office, is this idea that we can have better lives if we control certain things. Ada Comstock was the daughter of Solomon Comstock. And she was a very accomplished woman. She was a, really a pioneer in women's education. During Prohibition, President Herbert Hoover, towards the end of Prohibition, selected 12 of the finest minds in America to figure out why Prohibition wasn't working. And Ada Comstock was the only woman on that committee. They called it the Wickersham Commission. By this time, Ada Comstock was a president at Radcliffe College. They compile the mountains of information, you know, the birth of the mafia, of police corruption, organized crime, why prohibition wasn't working. And the commission concluded that we just need to enforce it more, and it was ignored. Soon after the Wickersham Commission's report was released, it was a big wave election, and the Wets won. The people elected to Congress in the 1932 election, including Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, got elected in part saying that we'll bring back beer. In 1933, uh, U.S. Congress passed a, a law saying that 3.2% alcohol by weight beer was legal. It was non-intoxicating, so they could sell it. So that was the first stage in, in the repeal of, of prohibition. Here in Clay County, uh, laws were passed that said that, uh, in, for instance, in Moorhead, uh, you couldn't set up a 3-2 beer only stand where you only sold 3-2 beer bar, essentially. It had to be associated with some other business. So the number of uh, restaurants, quote, restaurants, uh, uh, suddenly went from, I think it was 14 to 32. They'd sell an occasional hamburger, but it's mostly it was places to sell 3-2 beer. The way that we measure uh, alcohol content is a little different. We measure by, by volume today, they used to by weight. So basically the beer that they were selling, 3-2 three, three, beer, was more like 4% alcohol, which is about like Miller Lite today. So it's pretty intoxicating for, for non-intoxicating uh, alcohol. In uh, the 1890s, early 20th century, uh, when North Dakota went dry, Moorhead and Clay County were faced with the decision to uh, uh, how to deal with this influx of liquor. And uh, they could have uh, legislated, they could have uh, um, enforced the law, uh, kept the, a lid on things, but they didn't. Uh, they saw the money coming in and uh, just saw dollar signs and uh, turned a blind eye to the real significant problems that liquor uh, brought with them. The result was street crime, uh, domestic abuse, uh, political corruption, deep political corruption here in Moorhead. And uh, uh, the city developed a, a reputation, an unsavory reputation that took decades to live down. Okay. 
and today we have a mixed uh, bag, really a uh, more complicated system of dealing with alcohol. And we're still trying to sort this all out. We have a huge liquor problem. We have a alcohol problem in this community. Heavy drinking, binge drinking, as yes, particularly among the young, overall consumption. The Fargo-Moorhead metropolitan statistical area, the uh, Cass and Clay counties, uh, consistently rank in the top or near the top of uh, those those problems here in the United States. And we can't really have a problem in this community. We have to face it. copy of this program, call 1-800-359-6900 or visit our online store at prairiepublic.org. Production funding for Wet versus Dry is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.